Good morning. Welcome. My name is Tim Morrison, and this is the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago on one of our regular Sunday morning programs. Uh, I'd say normally we meet in person, but normal hasn't actually taken place for over a year now. Um, and we're hoping at some point we will be back at our home in Skokie, Illinois, but for the time being, we have been making uh, virtual gatherings and presentations. So we're glad you're with us this morning. And uh, I know like all of you, we're looking forward to coming back together uh, for real in the flesh, but we're gonna hold off a little longer. So uh, that being said, uh, again, welcome to our program this morning. I think it should be very interesting. Uh, what is humanism? There are a lot of different ways to define it. I personally like short, succinct description. So I found one that I think will help you out. Uh, it is humanism is a progressive life stance that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. Uh, and that's what we strive to do through our activities and gatherings at the Ethical Human Society of Chicago. Uh, so we provide, um, present a variety of programs on Sundays uh, covering a wide range of topics. And today I think we have a very interesting one. Uh, you'll forgive me, I have lots of pieces of paper in front of me just to keep us on track. Uh, this morning, Ayelet Fishbach is going to talk to us about uh, the science of motivation. Uh, she is the Jeffrey Breckenridge Keller Professor of Behavioral Science and Marketing at the University of Chicago. She studies social psychology, management, and consumer behavior. She is an expert on motivation and decision-making and has presented her research all over the world. Fishbach's research has been published in psychology, management, and marketing journals, and is regularly featured in the media, including Wall the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Chicago Tribune, NPR, and was selected to be featured in the New York Times annual Year in Ideas. She has served as an associate editor on several journals, including Psycho Psychological Science and the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and she has served on the editorial board of leading journals in psychology and management. She has further served as the president of the International Society of Cognition Network and the Society for the Study of Motivation. Uh, she's going to give us a presentation this morning. I'll just remind you that there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Uh, you will be able to submit questions in your chat box, which will go live after the presentation during uh, we take a small break so you'll be able to collect your thoughts. Uh, so as Ayala did speaking, think about some questions, jot them down, you'll have an opportunity to submit them. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Ayala. Hi, Tim. Good morning. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it is uh, uh, great to uh, spend some time with you. Uh, hopefully, I will uh, get to know a bit of your thoughts uh, uh, through your questions. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, my own question. I have uh, uh, one question uh, for you. Uh, Tim, I wonder if you can... Uh, share it here. Uh, it is uh, basically one single question that will help us see what people here in uh, this audience are thinking about. Uh, what are the things that you want to motivate yourself uh, uh, to do? Uh, please uh, choose all that apply. Uh, if you click on the, uh, the link in the chat, uh, uh, you'll get there and I will be Happy to share the results as soon as I see uh, your uh, responses here. Okay. Uh, so uh, I asked you what are some things that people uh, are struggling with. Uh, it seems that in our uh, small sample here, uh, we uh, have exercising as a uh, number uh, one. Uh, then uh, uh, eating healthily is uh, uh, also uh, up there, uh, so the uh, same number of people as, uh, as exercising. Uh, number uh, three is uh, uh, maintain relationships with friends, stay uh, connected to, uh, to people when we are uh, somewhat uh, uh, isolated. Isolated, and then I have uh, some people selecting uh, everything else that is uh, uh, there on uh, uh, on the list. So just to 
to give you an idea uh, of the, the kind of things that are harder than ever to, to do today, uh, I've been talking to many audiences, completing work tasks, exercising, eating healthily, getting out of bed in the morning, maintaining relationships with, with family, with, with friends, saving money, planning for the, uh, the future, uh, even uh, uh, just uh, uh, relaxing uh, seems to be a uh, harder uh, this uh, this year uh, more than ever. Uh, I am going to uh, switch to uh, my slides here and tell you a little bit about what I found as I was uh, researching uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, topic. Here we go. So I spent uh, uh, the, the last 20 years or so uh, studying motivation, studying how to motivate others, uh, how uh, we motivate ourselves. Uh, and uh, over the last couple of years, I summarized everything that I've learned in, uh, in a book. I titled this book, uh, Get It Done. It's not out there uh, yet, uh, uh, but I can show you uh, what I discovered as I was uh, uh, going over this uh, uh, journey. Uh, so, if you think about it, there are four areas of uh, uh, motivating ourselves, of, of what I would call self-motivation. Uh, we can call them the, the four elements of motivation. And, and this is basically where we see most of the research on motivation, uh, most of the strategies that we developed as we were studying motivation to help people stay uh, motivated. Uh, some of these interventions address setting a goal, and this is where I'm going to, to start. So the first thing that you do is set a goal. You, you need to know where you are going. Uh, the second element, the second area of interventions about motiv uh, motivation is uh, uh, sustaining your motivation as you go from here to, to there. So basically how we, we think about monitoring progress, when do we look back versus uh, ahead, uh, think about how do we collect and learn from feedback. The uh, third area or the third element uh, involves everything else that, that happens as we are striving toward a particular goal. We never just want one, one thing. How do we address these multiple goals? How do we address the conflict between goals, self-control conflicts? And uh, the fourth element, the fourth area of research and interventions that help us with uh, uh, motivation uh, involves social support. And you uh, already saw on the survey that I presented that this is something that we are uh, all struggling with in particular now. How do uh, we get the, the people that help us uh, connect with us? Uh, and indeed, a lot of the, the research uh, uh, is about designing social support. So without further ado, let me uh, tell you uh, what uh, we discovered. Starting with uh, setting a goal, uh, here is a, a very powerful goal, getting to the top of Mount Everest. It is a very powerful goal. It's a goal that people are willing to risk their lives in order to achieve, which means that sometimes it is too powerful. Uh, as you can see, there is a long line of people waiting to get uh, to the uh, peak here. Uh, it is a strong, powerful goal because it is very clear whether you achieved it. You need to be exactly at, uh, at the peak. Uh, it is a, a, a goal that uh, is not a means to another goal. It is the thing itself that people are pursuing. It is an intrinsic uh, goal. And so even though there are great incentives for getting to the top of the Everest, your friends will admire you for doing so. Uh, the reason that uh, mountaineers uh, uh, do that is uh, because they are intrinsically motivated because they really want to get there. So uh, let me uh, break uh, uh, this goal into separate lessons that we can apply to uh, our lives. Uh, uh, one thing is that we want to set goals that are not means, they are the, uh, the goal themselves. Uh, take, for example, the, the fact that no one likes to, to pay for, for shipping or uh, packaging uh, or parking. Okay, uh, We don't like to pay for these things because this is not the goal itself. This is a means to a goal. Uh, take this uh, uh, 
study that I ran with uh, uh, my uh, student, Franklin Shady, a few years ago, uh, we uh, gave uh, our students, our MBA students, an opportunity to participate in an auction of this book that was signed by my colleague, uh, Richard Taylor. Okay, so this is the misbehaving book. It's a famous book. Uh, and the average bid for the book alone was $23. However, when we did a similar auction for another group of my MBA students in which we suggested that they will bid on this tote bag, which contained this book, the average bid was just $12, okay? People are bidding $23 for the book and $12 for a tote bag that carries this exact book. How is this possible? Well, the reason we get this uh, non-normative uh, result is that People don't like to pay for packaging, okay? And they see the tote bag as, as packaging. In our own life, if we uh, set a goal in a way that describes the purpose of this goal, why are we doing this? Other than how are we going to get there? This will be more motivating. Uh, we know that challenging goals uh, are better. Uh, if we set our goals to be Challenging to be uh, somewhat at the, at the limit for what we can possibly achieve, we are going to be more motivated than if we set them to be easy. Uh, here's the distribution of marathon uh, runners, almost 10 million marathon runners in the uh, US. And what is interesting is that if you look at the distribution, it's not smooth. There are many more people that are finishing just below four hours than just after four hours. People much rather finish a marathon at three hours and 59 minutes than at four hours and one minute. And so they, they push themselves and, and they end up being on that, uh, you know, just below the, uh, the round time. So just below four hours. Also, again, here, just below uh, five hours. Challenging goals work. Uh, intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is what we feel when we do something as an end in itself. Okay? We, we find it weird to ask, why are you doing this? Because part of the reason that you do it is that, that you like doing it, that it is fulfilling, that it is satisfying, that it is interesting, and uh, maybe even uh, fun. For many of the goals that we set, they are not completely intrinsically uh, motivating. You can answer why you do this. There is some extrinsic benefits for doing so, but the extent to which the goal has intrinsic motivation in it will predict persistence. So take new year resolutions. Uh, new resolutions is something that we, uh, we set because we, uh, uh, we, we feel that we need to do it, not because we want to do this. We might have uh, set a resolution to eat healthier this year. Uh, the extent to which we enjoy pursuing these new year resolutions predicts persistence three months after we set them. Okay, if we found healthy food that we enjoy eating, we are more likely to stick to this resolution by March. Uh, same for uh, time spent studying and exercising. These are studies in which we followed students as they were studying in the library or gym goers as they were uh, exercising at the gym. The extent to which they enjoyed activity, they found it intrinsically motivating, they were interested, they were persisting for longer. Uh, how important they thought exercising and studying uh, were uh, that uh, uh, did not uh, predict much. In other research, what we find is that to the extent that people choose a food or an exercise or anything else based on intrinsic motivation, to the extent that they find a way to do something that is important for them, such that it's also enjoyable and satisfying at the moment, they are going to uh, persist longer. Do people know that? Do people know that it's important to choose to uh, study something that is interesting, a job that is uh, uh, fulfilling and, and, and so on? Um, yes and no, okay? They, they know that it's important for them right now, okay? So I know that whether I'm going to eat healthily uh, today or whether I will be enthusiastic to do my job today is based on intrinsic motivation. Uh, but I mispredict how much I will care about it when I plan it for the future. Uh, people don't think that they will care to be 
as intrinsically motivated when they think about their future job. Uh, also, people don't realize that other people care about intrinsic motivation just as much as they are. Incentives. We constantly use incentives to, to motivate ourselves. We promise ourselves uh, you know, a, a nice vacation, uh, maybe a, a glass of wine, uh, maybe uh, some uh, relaxing activity uh, if we achieve what we are set to achieve. Uh, we find that few incentives are better than many incentives. Few incentives give you a justification without over justification. When you give too much incentives, that obscure the purpose of the action. And to give you an example, in one study, we found that telling young children, this is children between the ages three and five, that food will make them stronger or smarter, made them eat less of this food. Uh, young children learn that uh, if my parents or uh, uh, teachers say that food will make me stronger, that's a sign that the food is not very tasty and they don't eat. Uncertain incentives uh, work better than certain incentives. Uh, for example, uh, most of us would prefer to uh, work for $50 for sure than uh, to work for a, an equal chance to get either $0 or $100, but we would work harder for an equal chance to win, uh, to earn $0 or $100 than uh, uh, to uh, get uh, $50 for sure. We work harder for uncertain uh, incentives, for example, uncertain bonuses. Let's uh, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, sustaining motivation. So we we've set a goal and it is intrinsically uh, motivating. Uh, it is a goal. It's not a means. We have not too many uh, incentives. Uh, maybe they are even uncertain. How do we sustain our motivation? How do we get from here to uh, there? Well, as we make progress, it becomes a bit easier. Uh, take college dropouts, for example. About half of the people that start college in the U.S. will not uh, end up with a college degree. They will not complete the journey. But most of those people who will drop out college will do it in the first year or two. Okay? There are very few, relatively, college students that uh, quit when they are almost at the, at the end, okay? when they are close to finish their four-year college. Uh, same for loyalty programs. You probably started many loyalty programs. You got these uh, uh, cards and maybe you got some points for making a purchase. And most likely you did not persist on most of these programs. But you usually drop these programs at the beginning. Okay? When you're only one purchase away from a prize, let's say you're only one purchase uh, away from a free beverage, uh, you are going to uh, buy this uh, last coffee, uh, use your card and earn the, the free beverage. Why? There are two reasons why progress is often uh, the, the way to increase commitment, to increase motivation. Uh, first, just by the fact that we made progress, we feel more committed. Okay, We look back and we say, yes, I can do it. I have been already doing it. Okay, I've been already in college for a year. I guess I can continue doing this. Uh, on top of this increase in commitment, it's interesting to note that the contribution of each additional step will appear larger. This is in particular if you, you think about these goals where you, you get the prize when you finish the goal, like you get the college degree when you finish college or you get the the pre-beverage when you finish uh, uh, making all your purchases. The first year in college got you one quarter of a college degree. The last year gave you a full college degree. Let's uh, envision a, a buy 10, get one free uh, loyalty program. Uh, the first purchase got you a tenth of the reward. Okay, The last purchase got you 100% of the, the reward. And so the the contribution of each step will appear larger, which is why it is often a good idea to just do something and assume that uh, motivation and commitment will follow. 
Okay, if we just start and then we, we look back and we see that we are already doing it, that is going to uh, motivate us to uh, continue. But there are certain goals, in particular those goals that don't quite have an end state, you don't quite reach the, you know, the point where you earn it and you can disengage, okay? like, like exercising okay? or like uh, you know, uh, being social with uh, uh, people. Uh, being healthy. Uh, for these goals, we also see that sometimes when people do them, when people pursue them, they, they disengage, okay? In a way, they use what they did in the past as an excuse uh, to uh, not do uh, so much in uh, uh, the future. Uh, I believe I have here uh, an example for this effect when uh, Doing something leads to feeling depleted, feeling licensed to disengage. Uh, here it is. I, you know, you, you look at this picture and, the, and you say like, what? Like, why would anybody use the escalator in order to go to the gym? Uh, after all, once they get to the fitness center, they are probably going to get on the, on the you know, some machine that is going to ask them to do exactly what they do now, which is exercise. Uh, but if you think about it, every time you choose the elevator instead of the stairs, you are, are basically doing something that goes against uh, what you did when you were exercising, okay? Uh, when you uh, ex were exercising at home or in the gym. And so we all do uh, uh, this kind of uh, budgeting with ourselves when we say, well, because I exercised, I uh, no, uh, don't need to uh, uh, take the stairs or uh, uh, I don't need to do uh, certain things that are good for me. And, and this pattern can be problematic because to the extent that we undo what we do, uh, then we stay in the same place. Uh, realizing that uh, sometimes looking at what we have done decreases motivation, other research looked at when is it best to monitor progress in terms of the glass half full or the glass half empty. What I, I mean here is not in terms of being a, a pessimist or an optimist, uh, but uh, whether your attention is to the progress that you have already made, in which case you look at the glass half full, or the progress that is still needed to be made, okay? In which case you look at the glass and uh, half empty. And what research finds is that at the beginning of pursuing a goal for novices, uh, for uncommitted individuals, it is best to look back, okay? Look back to see how much you have done uh, will help you stay motivated. It will boost your commitment and uh, you would feel more assured that you can do it. But beyond the midpoint or toward the end of pursuing a goal, uh, if you are experts, uh, if you are committed to uh, uh, what you do, uh, then it makes sense to actually look at the, at the glass half empty, okay? At what needs to do, okay? Uh, think about relationship goals as, as an example. If the relationship is, is new and you're not quite sure whether it's uh, uh, worth your time to invest in this uh, uh, new friendship, uh, well, looking at the fact that you already invested, you already connected with this person, you had a nice time before, will increase your motivation to uh, uh, pick up the phone and get in touch again. However, when you think about the relationship with uh, with close people, okay, it's often the lack of progress, okay, the realization that you haven't been in touch for a while, okay, that, that maybe you did not pick uh, uh, pick up the phone for uh, quite some time, is what is going to motivate you to get in touch with this person. They are probably waiting to hear from you. Uh, we also find that how people monitor the progress, whether they look back at what they have done versus at what is left for them to do will influence their level of aspiration. And we tested this in the work uh, context. This uh, in particular was tested in one uh, study that I remember us uh, running in, uh, uh, in South Korea, in, in Seoul, uh, in an advertising agency. Uh, we asked uh, as some employees to look back and reflect on what they achieved last year and other employees to look forward and tell us what they still needed to achieve that year. 
And it was the people who looked forward at the glass half empty that had higher level of aspiration, that wanted to climb the ladder, that were already eyeing the next world that they will be qualified to uh, have uh, once they, uh, they do well in their present uh, position. Uh, this leads me to uh, um, uh, this realization. In the middle, there's going to be some problem. Okay, uh, Motivation might be fragile. At the beginning, we look back and we say, oh, we did all that. Uh, uh, we, we are already on track. Uh, uh, we, we can keep on. We feel motivated. Uh, toward the end, we look forward and we say, I'm almost there. Like the, the, the peak is, is just, you know, a few uh, feet away, uh, people walk hard. Uh, in the middle is when uh, uh, motivation tends to be uh, fragile. Uh, one solution is to keep middle short. Okay, I try uh, uh, maybe to think about a monthly saving goal or an annual saving goal and not saving just for retirement, in which case the, the goal might be too far, okay, in particular if you are a young person. Uh, so, you know, be aware of it. Think about how to make uh, uh, middles uh, uh, short. Uh, here's a, a study that illustrates uh, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, here we were uh, following uh, observant Jewish participants in Israel, uh, looking to see how often they light the menorah over the eight nights of Hanukkah. And for uh, these people, in order to follow the tradition, they needed to light the menorah every night for eight consecutive nights. But as you see, the majority of them were doing it on the first night. The majority of them were doing it on the, uh, the last night. Uh, in the, uh, the middle, uh, motivation was uh, uh, lower, uh, with only about half of the people uh, lighting uh, uh, the menorah. Uh, no, one uh, demonstration, uh, other research uh, looks at how much people follow the personal standards, how much they, they do a good job, they, they follow the ethical uh, standards, uh, and usually there is better adherence to your personal standards at the beginning and the end than in the, uh, the middle. Let's move to uh, feedback and, you know, to, to make progress, to move from here to there, we need to collect feedback. Uh, in particular, we need to learn from both positive and negative feedback. I am not going to say much about how to learn from positive feedback because it is very easy. Okay, we love positive feedback and we know how to learn from it. And uh, negative feedback is often more problematic. I have you one quote by Serena Williams, who uh, tells us that she has grown most from uh, failures, from setbacks, uh, not from uh, victories. Um, you probably heard that you should fail forward, that you should learn from failure. I have been sitting in many graduation speeches and the common theme is the recommendation to fail and learn from failure. You know why everybody tells us to learn from failure? Because it's really hard to do. It's the reason I remind my son to wash his hands. Okay? Without reminder, he will not do this. We are reminded to learn from negative feedback because it is so hard to do. Here is an example for how, how we document this in uh, uh, research. I can ask you what this symbol uh, means in Hindi. And no, if you guess foot, then I tell you that you were wrong. If you guess hand, I tell you that you were right. And to the extent that you see that there are only two options, you should know that this symbol means hand if you guessed foot and I told you that you were wrong. Okay? It's not impossible to make this inference. Here's another example. I can ask you which couple is real. This is actually from one of our studies. Uh, this couple or this couple. Well, if you guess one and I tell you that you, will, that you were wrong, you should be able to learn that this is the other, just as much that if you guessed it correctly and you heard that you were correct, you should now know the uh, correct answer. So using this paradigm where we basically present people with binary question that is whether they are right or wrong, they should be able to infer the, the right uh, answer. Uh, we uh, tested how much people learn when we tell them that they were right versus uh, that they were wrong. And across hundreds of people, 
uh, we find that there is learning from success feedback much more than from failure feedback. If people guess things correctly, they know the answer at 80% of the time. Okay, they, they show a uh, really nice learning. Uh, if people initially guessed incorrectly, when people guess incorrectly, they know the correct answer just at 59% of the time. Now, this is important. Remember, they have 50% chance of getting it right just by guessing, which means that they are almost at the chance level. Okay, they're only slightly above guessing uh, after they got failure at feedback. Learning from failure feedback is hard. Learning from failure feedback is hard because it is emotionally difficult. Okay, we, we don't want to fail. We, we feel that our ego is bruised when we uh, fail. It is also cognitively more difficult. Okay? When we fail, we learn what not to do and we need to do this mental switch that if it's not this, then it's that. Uh, this is not easy. Okay. If you have a pet and you ever try to, to, try and, to train them uh, using negative feedback, you probably discover that this is extremely hard. Okay. If you yell at your dog for peeing on the carpet, well, your, your dog realizes that you're upset, but probably has no idea what is the correct response. Uh, if you uh, praise your, your dog for uh, going to, to, you know, to do their business outside, uh, then they can learn. Okay. It is easier cognitively to learn to repeat successful responses than to infer that if it's not this, then it must be something else. There are several remedies, uh, several uh, interventions that motivation scientists develop in order to assist people to, to learn from uh, feedback. Uh, changing the culture, this is in particular in the context of uh, organiz organizations and, uh, and corporate culture, teaching uh, uh, employees that, that they have the right to fail, that we learn from failure, that we uh, celebrate failures is uh, uh, one of my uh, first signal to know that there is a healthy culture in an organization. Uh, recalling or developing commitment and expertise when we feel more assured that this is for us and we can do it, then it's easier to, to learn from failure, from what didn't go well. And there is a, a really great work uh, by Carol Dweck on growth mindset, teaching people that when they fail, well, they may have not made progress toward completing the specific goal, but they learn, okay, the brain develop. Okay, understanding that whether we succeed or fail, our brain develops, there is some learning that is going on, helps people develop a growth mindset and learn from negative feedback. Observing others' failure is, a, is often a good remedy. They don't sting. Uh, getting advice, uh, sorry, giving advice to another person uh, is another uh, remedy. Uh, asking teachers, for example, to reflect on some fail, failure experiences that they had by giving advice to another uh, person, another teacher, increase their, their motivation. And finally, distance, distancing ourselves from, from failure. Uh, one uh, interesting and, and useful remedy here is taking a third party uh, perspective. So talking about myself as, as I yell it, okay, why I yell it failed, uh, what does I yell it need to do, uh, helps people cope with failure, learn from it uh, more than if they, they talk to themselves in terms of me, why did I fail, uh, what's wrong with me. Let's move to addressing multiple goals. And, you know, uh, when, when I just started to think about multiple goals, I, I encountered this uh, advice, uh, uh, the Kierkegaard's advice to uh, wheel just that uh, one thing. It's uh, what uh, uh, philosophers here, yeah, uh, some philosophers advice, it's the uh, existentialist uh, uh, movement that introduced this idea. Psychologists don't think that this is possible. So you know what, don't even bother. Uh, what we advise instead is to pick your battle. Always aspire for, we always aspire for multiple and conflicting goals. Let's see what are our priorities. Let's understand 
which goal comes before uh, others. Psychologists also study how goals are connected to each other and how they are connected to their means of attainment. So let me uh, share uh, some of our thinking about goal systems, how all our goals are organized together in our uh, mind. Uh, here's one organization, we call it Equifinal. Uh, we have several means that all lead to the same goal. You can think about it in terms of all roads lead to Rome. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, I can uh, spread the, the word about my research uh, by talking to you. That would be the first means. I can uh, uh, write papers that are... Uh, directed toward uh, other researchers. Uh, I can uh, write a book that is uh, meant to be read by the general public. Uh, the other organization that is important for us is that this one where we have one activity or one means that achieves several uh, goals. Uh, you know, so uh, maybe by uh, speaking to you uh, this morning, I get to spread the word about my research. Uh, maybe I get to hear from you and get some ideas for other research that uh, I want to do. Uh, uh, maybe I just uh, uh, get connected to uh, uh, this amazing organization and this is a third goal. I, I chose to uh, summarize this with uh, uh, this uh, uh, phrase, feed two birds with one scone, uh, mainly because I am vegetarian. Why these organizations are important? Well, equifinal means increased confidence. If you can think of several ways by which you can do something, you feel more confident. So it's always useful to think about these other ways. Multifinal means maximize attainment. And so we are motivated to do that. If I can think of three different things that I can achieve with one action, I might be more motivated okay, than if I can only think about at one goal, so again, they are useful. Another way to think about so, uh, multiple goals and, and, and the conflict that they, they pose uh, is uh, thinking about self-control uh, conflict. A lot of the research in motivation science is on self-control, on how to, to get people to overcome temptations, on how to get people to overcome immediate gratification, to uh, be more uh, patient. Uh, it's also interesting to note that we were thinking as, as humans about self-control from the, uh, the beginning of times. It appears uh, uh, in the Bible here with uh, uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, it appears in uh, Greek uh, mythology. It is everywhere. In modern times, self-control has been associated with everything that we care about. So people with uh, better self-control have uh, a higher academic achievement. Uh, they are more satisfied with their jobs, uh, better financial savings. Uh, basically, people, the most recent research that I've seen is that people with stronger self-control uh, make more money by the age of 46. Uh, they are also better with relationship maintenance. They are more likely to have uh, a strong, uh, stable relationships with uh, uh, their spouses. But people complain constantly that uh, uh, self-control is hard. Uh, here is one such complaint. I don't mean to brag, but I finished my 14-day diet in 3 hours and 12 minutes. So what does it take to be successful at self-control? Well, according to motivation research, first we need to identify a conflict and then we need to resolve a conflict. First, we need to see that this opportunity to do something might conflict with something else that I want to do that might be more important for me. For example, to see this one donut as, uh, as something that uh, is inconsistent with my overriding goal to eat healthily. Okay, or to uh, see a, a small uh, unethical offense as, as something that is inconsistent consistent with being an ethical person. Only once people identify the conflict, then they can resolve it, then they can record the, the mental operations that help us cope with uh, uh, temptations, okay, with self control conflicts. Uh, what helps us identify a temptation? Well, one way is to think about multiple decisions together. 
Okay, if I think about taking office supply uh, from my office for personal use, just as a one-time thing, okay, just like one pen or whatever, okay, one uh, paper block, okay, uh, that uh, is unlikely to to elicit a self-control uh, uh, response. Uh, but if I think about always taking office supply from work home, uh, then that might come up. Uh, don't assume that everyone does it. Uh, you know, th this reminds me of uh, uh, the story with uh, uh, Lance uh, Armstrong, who uh, once uh, uh, claimed that the reason that he was uh, uh, using uh, uh, basically illegal practices, uh, doping, uh, was because he believed that everyone else was doing it. So, you know, by, by doing this, you're basically just like everybody else. Don't assume that. Uh, assume that your actions are consistent, whatever you chose to eat or do today uh, is what you're going to uh, choose to do uh, the next day and the one after. And also thinking about how our actions reflect on who we are as a person, uh, how what I decide to do today is going to tell me and the world what kind of person I am. That makes it easier to identify our goals and uh, uh, combat uh, temptations. In terms of battling temptations, uh, what research finds is that it is easier if you know about it in advance. Uh, take uh, uh, this person uh, here. If he expects this box to be heavy, uh, it is going to be easier to uh, prepare for this and to apply more force and therefore to lift this package. If he thinks that this box is going to be very uh, light, it is probably going to be harder to uh, lift it. Okay. Knowing that uh, there will be uh, alcohol in, in the party uh, helps people uh, prefer and uh, control their, their drinking, uh, for example. Uh, finally, uh, the, the last element of self-motivation is designing social support, is, is getting other people to help us. If you stop for a second and think about what you want to achieve in your life, you probably don't want to achieve this alone. Okay, whether it's a, you know, at a small group, okay, maybe you want to start a family or a large group, okay, maybe you want to uh, uh, start a, a company, uh, maybe you want to, to do something as an organization. If it's important, other people are with you, okay? We, we don't usually pursue important goals by ourselves. Specifically, there are two ways in which others help us. One way is that they actually do it with us, okay? Like starting a company or a family or, you know, pulling rope, okay? The other way is that they inspire us, okay? We work alone, but we work in the presence of others and having them around us motivates us, inspires us, helps us to, to stick with our uh, goals. Here we are thinking more about role models. Okay, How do we select the people that being in their company is going to make us what, do what is important for us uh, to do? Uh, let me say something about working with others. So this is the, the pulling rope, the rope uh, uh, metaphor. Uh, once again, motivation science finds that it's important where they are you look at what other people do or not do, okay? And it matters such that if you are uncommitted, okay, if you are new to the group or you don't know if the group's cause is important, well, you want to look at existing contributions. You want to look at what other people are already doing, okay? If you see that other people are doing, you want to, to do more. Okay, but if you are very committed to the group, if the group is absolutely critical for, for how you see yourself, for what is important for you in life, uh, then you are more likely to spur into action when you think about what other people did not do, okay? what is uh, uh, still uh, missing. Here's an example for that uh, from uh, a charity campaign that we uh, ran uh, some years ago. Uh, we uh, basically, well, we ran this in, uh, in Korea uh, and we basically had two groups of donors. We had donors who gave money before and donors who did not give money before. Uh, for the uh, donors who never gave money, okay, the new people, 
it was more effective to tell them how much money we already collected, okay, the, the glass half full. Uh, for the, the regular donors, the donors that we're giving basically every month, they were more motivated to increase their helping uh, when we highlighted that there is still halfway to go. Okay, so in both cases, we started this campaign where we were at about the midpoint, okay, but for some people, it was more effective to tell them how much other people have done, for others, how much other people are still uh, missing. Uh, moving to uh, uh, role models and conformity pressure and how the presence of others in our life might influence how we pursue our goals. Uh, well, here is an example for uh, an electricity bill that I think is similar to what most of us uh, get. Uh, as you see, uh, most uh, electricity companies in, in, in the US uh, at this point are trying to give you information on how much electricity you use how much the average neighbor in uh, your, your area and how much the efficient neighbor uh, would spend. Uh, trying to, to inspire people to save energy by giving them information about others, about other people that are around them that they might care about. Uh, role models are critical. What we find is that it's often good to think about what your role model values, not just what they do, okay? So we often like to eat the, the food that other people recommend as their favorite, not necessarily what others eat, okay? Or online, we, we follow other people's likes and ratings uh, more than a number of views or uh, sales information. Uh, and so we, we want to choose role models that don't just do, but that express certain values about what they think is important for us to do. Okay, so uh, uh, this was a very brief summary, uh, or, you know, at least it felt brief to me, uh, of uh, uh, what uh, I titled here as the four elements of motivation. Uh, we, uh, we want to understand how to set a goal, how to sustain our motivation, how to address multiple goals and how to uh, design a uh, social support. I have uh, recently thought a lot about everything that we found in uh, uh, this domain, uh, summarized it in uh, uh, this book, which I uh, hope uh, will be uh, out and available to you uh, probably at the beginning of next year in January. So thank you very much. I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ayelet. That was very interesting. Uh, we're going to take a brief pause here, an opportunity for everyone to think about some questions. Uh, the way it's going to work is you will put them in the chat and I will see them. And then I will take the opportunity to ask Ayelet your questions uh, on your behalf, if you will. Uh, well, we're in a pause. Um, we'd like to motivate you, as it were, <laughs> to make a donation to the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. Uh, if you click the link that you see below, that's one way to make a donation. You can also use Zelle, uh, and it's donate at ethicalhuman.org would be the Zelle method to get there. Uh, we suggest a donation of $5, but of course, anything you choose to give is appreciated. Uh, we depend on the financial contributions of uh, people like you to help our society uh, maintain and present great programs like this and to do all that we do. And we also depend on uh, people who can contribute their time to keep the society uh, rolling forward. So with that in mind, we're going to take a little break, make a donation, and think of some questions. We'll be back in a few moments.
thank you so much uh, for donating. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think we're going to dive into some questions. Um, let's see what we've got. Uh, to, oh, is Ayala with us? Or am I alone? There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. To what extent is a apparent failure an insight into a poorly formed goal? Like escalator to the gym, did time at gym or reps become a goal instead of one framed? Uh, Re fitness versus wellness. Did that makes sense. Would you like me to repeat that? Uh, yeah, actually, I see this question from from Katie, and I uh, try to uh, make sure I understand that and this because I I can understand it in a. Uh, at least two different uh, ways, and I well, maybe I should answer both uh, uh, question. Okay, uh, sometimes we don't define the goal correctly. Okay, or we uh, define the goal such that there is a, a shortcut to achieve it, uh, which uh, which is a bad shortcut. So, you know, like the the book example is what we call the, uh, the Cobra effect. Uh, and the Cobra effect is, is named after a program to eliminate uh, uh, cobras in India uh, back in the days uh, by uh, using a bounty uh, uh, system, basically. So, so, you know, if you bring a dead cobra, you get some money. And how do you get a dead cobra? Well, you first need to have a live cobra. And so what people did was raising cobras so they can... Uh, no, have dead cobras. Okay, uh, a very poorly uh, designed uh, incentive systems. Uh, if we do our goals in this way, okay, if we come up with uh, uh, with definition of the goal that uh, is not exactly what we want to achieve, uh, then we might end up doing the uh, the wrong thing. Okay, we we might end up. Uh, uh, you know, spending a lot of time reading, but reading very few pages in the book, in which case we didn't really read, but we did do our half an hour reading, for for example. So I, I think maybe this is what Katie uh, meant, but Tim, if you have another understanding, uh, let me know. I think that's good. Um, we have plenty of questions, so we can just sort of roll forward here. Uh, is there any insight into... Um, thinking about how to prioritize goals and forgive yourself failure on one when it has to give way to one of the high, one of a higher priority. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it, th this is a really uh, important question. And this is in particular an important question for a developmental uh, psychologist. And uh, no, I, I'm in a conversation with that, uh, with people that are studying aging. And this is one of the challenges with aging, uh, how do you know which goals to, to focus on? How do you reprioritize your goals in life such that you, you give up on something uh, because it, uh, uh, it stands in the way of something else because resources, in particular physical resources, are uh, often uh, more limited. And so, you know, how uh, do you make difficult decisions such as uh, uh, moving uh, out of your house in order to uh, uh, maintain uh, uh, your uh, important goals such as uh, uh, staying connected to uh, to family or being able to engage in an important uh, hobby? Uh, definitely part of motivating ourselves is to to think about uh, what we need to let go what we need to prioritize over other things okay uh how thinking about behaviors um that you desire how to you've accomplished a goal or you want to how do you turn it into a habit so that achieving the goal becomes more or less automatic uh, yeah, so uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, insights on, uh, uh, on on the role of habits. Habits are, you know, good habits are great. And, and the reason good habits are great is because they are somewhat automatic. Because if you are in the habit of exercising every morning, you exercise because it's the morning. Okay, not, uh, uh, you don't need to, to think about it consciously. You don't need to do a, a lot of planning. 
Now, the best intuitive example is brushing your teeth. At one point in your life, brushing your teeth required motivating yourself and like doing this, uh, and your parents were uh, helping you. But nonetheless, uh, for uh, most of us at this point, uh, we don't even think about it. Uh, so, you know, to the extent that we can make other pursuit of goals uh, similar to brushing our teeth, then we will. Uh, exercise or read or uh, learn or uh, help uh, important organizations in our lives uh, just because we are at the right time and in, in the day or in the week. Uh, we don't need to think about it too much. Very efficient. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of questions that are kind of related. And I'm going to fold them together. The first question or the first part of it is, what is the best way to motivate a group? And um, how do you adjust your advice about how to motivate a group uh, when they're trying to discuss a goal and then the influence of naysayers on achieving that goal within the group? So the, the main challenge with that with groups is what we call social loafing. Okay? So uh, basically, uh, if everybody here is already doing something, uh, then uh, I, I don't feel uh, so compelled to, to do that. Uh, and there are a few ways to combat social loafing. Uh, one way is to make contributions more identifiable, uh, to know how much each group member uh, contributed. Uh, you know, one example that comes to my mind is uh, uh, charity campaigns where every contribution is mentioned with uh, the name. Okay, so you will know that Ayelet contributed and how much Ayelet contributed. Uh, that will significantly decrease uh, social loafing. Uh, the other advice that I have is, is to think about how uh, cohesive the, the group is. Uh, if people are very committed to this group, then you, you want to highlight what's missing, what we can still do. Uh, if cohesiveness is relatively low, if people are not really sure, then you want to highlight uh, what uh, has been done. Okay. Uh, psychology experiments and studies are often run on college students who are not representative of uh, the US population to some extent. So um, the findings that you shared, are they generalizable? Um, how do you take them from the groups that you use them and apply them to a larger, more diverse population? So, so first that uh, has changed. That is uh, uh, not longer uh, the, the truth, uh, uh, basically in the last few years, uh, a large chunk of the, uh, the studies are uh, moving online. I would say that over the last year, most of the over 95% of the behavioral science is basically uh, conducted online like uh, uh, everything else. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, we are still getting, it's, it's, it's still easier to get some populations more than others. For example, if you sign up to do studies online, uh, we are much more likely to learn about your psychology uh, than if you uh, did not uh, uh, sign up. Uh, so the, the, the bias is, uh, is still something to, the selection bias is still something to consider, uh, although we are less concerned about studying uh, only uh, students. Uh, we are going to start, uh, I think, in just a couple of months uh, uh, collecting data in uh, downtown Chicago. We are uh, opening uh, basically an open lab for uh, the people in Chicago to stop by. It's going to be just on the other side of the Art Institute. And, uh, and, and this is just one of many initiatives that we do in order to, um, to get to more diverse populations. So very much on our mind. Okay. How do you think about achieving goals that relate to not being too focused on time, money, et cetera, but um, rather to just sort of stop and smell the flowers? How do, do we focus too much on goals with quantifiable outcomes? Hey, we are probably too much focused on quantifiable outcomes and uh, for the reason that they are easy to, to measure. Um, so for example, I, I know uh, 
I want to be in a good shape and it's easier uh, to count the number of times that I exercised. I uh, want to uh, broaden my horizons and it's easier to count the, the number of books that I have read. And so we uh, uh, intuitively gravitate toward uh, things that are easy to, to measure. Uh, and uh, the once we are aware of it, the, the way to deal with it is to, to think about what uh, what's important uh, for us. There is an interesting process that I don't have the data for this. I just have many anecdotes that I many people I think uh, are over the last year are experiencing something similar where they you know, we need to reprioritize. We need to think about what's important for us in life. Okay, like who are the people that we want to see? Uh, what do we want to do? Uh, so, so you know, we we are coming out of a crisis, and that is a good time for many people to uh, rethink their priorities, and ideally, not just pursue goals that are easy to measure. Uh, this is a question I'm going to take the chance to ask you: um, the sort of commercial motivations, the the idea of retailers trying to motivate consumers, um, and then goals as an individual what's the crossover between your work and the sort of the crossover between commercial motivation and individual motivation so this is where i think team maybe i i'm not sure how to uh, make sense of it i mean do you mean that sometimes uh, companies are trying to get me to want something that i don't want that it's not good for me well, you talked about um, a loyalty club and buying 10 beverages and getting them, you know, you're really motivated to buy that 10th one because you know you've got a free one coming. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's motivation all around us, um, commercial, to meet commercial goals, if you will, um, and sort of the crossover between those using those goals in that commercial realm and then goal setting and motivation for me personally. I mean, it just, it seems like the tools are used in both places. And I don't know really where this question is going because I didn't have a lot of time to form it, but there you have it. Yeah, so I, I like that. So I will go with your understanding because this is uh, really the, the thing that I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about. As, um, as a field, we did a lot of work on how to motivate other people. Uh, and, you know, I'm in a, in a business school, so certainly a part of our audience uh, is, is companies and, and managers. And so, you know, managers thinking about how to motivate employees, uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking about how to, to motivate consumers and so on. Uh, but also, in, you know, in education, like teachers think how to uh, motivate students, uh, parents think about how to motivate uh, their, their children. And all of it I put under the bucket of motivating other people. But we can take this research and we can take these lessons and apply it to ourselves. We can also motivate ourselves. And you know, the, the most intuitive example is self-control. And so what I do in, in my work over the last couple of years is ask whether we can use ourselves as the subject of our motivational tools. So instead of motivating others, use the same tools to, uh, to motivate uh, ourselves. So you know, hopefully, what I presented today makes sense to you as a way to apply this to yourself, even though many of these tools were developed to motivate others, be it students, colleagues, employees, consumers, so on. Okay. Uh, do many people use negative role models uh, because they don't, uh, do many people use negative role models, people they don't want to be like? Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, when I wrote about role models, I have uh, you know, a section about these uh, negative role models. It is uh, often a good idea to look at the person you don't want to be like and the person you do want to be like. So you, you kind of see the, the range. Okay, I you know I, I can be this way, I can be uh, the other way, and I want to be closer to uh, my positive role model in a way than uh, uh, my negative role model. Saying that approaching a goal is usually better than avoiding 
a goal. So approaching a positive model is usually more effective than avoiding a negative world model just as much as any uh, positive framing. Okay, like I think about, you know, if I ask you to, to think about uh, a brown bear, you can do this. Now try to not think about a white bear. Impossible. Okay, so the positive frame is just easier. Okay. Uh, if strong shared goals and social norms are key to groups, how do we support movement to increase more diversity in workplaces, nonprofits, affinity groups, et cetera? Uh, well, if we understand that uh, diversity is important for performance, uh, diversity is not just a, a value and an in, in itself, which it is, okay, it is also something that will help us achieve other goals, okay, uh, diversity is multifinal uh, in, in this respect, uh, then we are going to try harder to make our organization more diverse so that we, we get those extra benefits and we're doing the right thing. Tim, I lost you. I hope the audience did not lose me, but I lost uh, uh, Tim. I... Uh, See now uh, a note that uh, uh, team uh, has uh, uh, dropped dropped us. So uh, you know, uh, the, I have another uh, another two team members here. Uh, I was wondering if you can put in the chat the other uh, survey, the survey that I accidentally uh, presented at the beginning. Okay, there is a second survey which. Uh, basically presents a few questions for you to, to reflect on uh, what I presented and the way I design it such is that you put your email and then you you think about a goal that you want to uh, pursue or a couple of goals and, and, and then answer a few questions. And then I email you uh, basically what you wrote uh, into uh, the survey in a way that, that you get an email from me which summarizes your, your thoughts. So uh, Sharon, if you can put it in the chat and here's Tim is back. I disappeared. My apologies. I hit the wrong button somewhere. <laughs> so. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you were sending, you were uh, doing the link for your uh, final form, I assume. Is that what was happening at this point? Uh, yeah, well, I, uh, uh, yeah, Sean uh, tells me that it's in the chat. So, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I have one more question here that I'm reading. Um, and let's see in your, if it's not X, it must be Y experiment was the subsequent question, RE the correct answer done right away, thus indicating poor logic or later, thus possibly involving memory also. Uh, so I uh, I believe that this is this is qu the question about the the study in which people are answering uh, uh, questions with possible answers. So they have a binary uh, choice and uh, uh, they don't seem to learn from a uh, failure. There is usually a few minutes break. Okay, so they do need to remember that they have given the the wrong answer and therefore that the right answer is uh, uh, the other one. Uh, however, uh, what we find is that I mean, two important things to, here. Uh, one is that when people make a mistake, they often don't remember their answer. Okay, and and so when you hear that you were wrong, you so much wish to disengage that you don't even remember what you said. Okay, and the other piece of information is that when people see someone else fails in this paradigm, they learn with no problem, okay? If I see Tim makes the wrong guess and hears that he was wrong, I will learn the correct answer. It's when we fail that it's things and we, we disengage, we don't remember. Uh, here's a pretty straightforward question. What do you find as the biggest misconception about motivation? 
Oh, uh, uh, you, you say that this is straightforward. Uh, uh, what, uh, uh, I, what the biggest uh, misconception? I would say that um, the biggest misconception is uh, uh, that uh, uh, that it's a matter of personality that you either uh, have it or not. Uh, that it's not uh, something that you can that. Everybody can do basically by changing your situation, okay? By changing your circumstances, uh, you, you can motivate yourself. And so, th th thinking that it's uh, like in you or not uh, uh, is a very uh, misleading, uh, common belief. Okay, uh, a question that has some application to our current world, the world we live in. It says, speaking of motivating students. How do I re-motivate my teenager who has to come to really hate school that has been 95% online this school year? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, can, can you like uh, uh, remote school? Is there something to uh, like about it? Uh, what can be uh, intrinsically uh, motivating about it are some of the, the questions to ask. Um, I would say uh, try it with uh, music. Try it with, uh, um, I don't know, some colored pencils. It depends on the age of uh, uh, the child. Uh, try it with a... Uh, uh, healthy uh, snack, uh, it, it is really critical for students and for all of us to enjoy what we are doing, right? Like we, we can do our job well if we like it. And so to expect high schoolers to, to study uh, because they care about their future in college, uh, this is unrealistic. They need to enjoy what they're doing at the moment. And what I'm basically doing now is generating ways in which you can make it more enjoyable at home without actually make the, the materials more enjoyable or the experience more enjoyable. Hopefully the experience will be more enjoyable as soon as everybody is together. Uh, what do you think uh, about fear as a motivator? Uh, works in the short run and uh, not in uh, uh, the long run. So like uh, like the avoidance uh, goals that we discussed, like the, uh, the bad uh, role model, it makes you feel that it's urgent, that you need to do something about it right now. Uh, but uh, as soon as uh, you, you took some immediate care of it, uh, uh, motivation goes down. Okay. Uh... I think we're going to kind of wrap it up with these uh, two questions that I'm going to fold together. Um, what might be uh, the top two or three unresolved questions in this field? And sort of as a part of that, what are you looking at next? What are you working on? Uh, so, um, no, the, the questions uh, for the field, uh, the, the, right now, uh, uh, the behavioral science is all geared of uh, uh, helping with the uh, pandemic in, in a big way. Okay, so how do we get people vaccinated? How do we get uh, uh, students to uh, uh, to study? Um, I do research on loneliness. Uh, how do you get people to cope with their loneliness? Uh, in terms of where most of my research is, a lot about learning from failure, a lot about patience. Uh, thinking about uh, uh, how how to help people uh, be more uh, patient, also something that came up in particular this year as people are constantly waiting for uh, things to uh, to become better. Um, uh, so I would say that these are my two uh, big questions at the moment. How has the your field responded to what's happened over the last year? I mean. What are people looking at? What are people doing? How are you seeing your yeah, role yeah. and helping out? A, a, a good question, Tim. I think that like everybody else, to, to begin with, we were uh, uh, just hoping that it will go away as soon as possible. So we, we will just be at home. I mean, we, we stopped most of our research operation because we were doing studies in person. Like I, I, mean, I, I used to like, go to, to gyms and then cafeterias and like see what people do and then you know, and buy and eat and exercise. And all that uh, stopped in uh, one day uh, last March. 
Uh, and then uh, we uh, we developed. We found that uh, the online space allows for uh, much more than uh, than we thought is possible. And so we developed a whole uh, online lab where people come and sign up for studies, and they actually meet an experimenter and interact with them. Uh, then uh, uh, we were excited by all the, the new problems that, uh, uh, that emerged. And so we, um, at, at this point, uh, feel good that, uh, that we learn how to uh, do research when it's really hard and that uh, uh, there are important problems for us as a as society uh, to address. So I, I, I th I'd say that we are in a good space, but you know, like everybody else, we can't wait to <laughs> yeah, have some normalcy. <laughs> so, well, I think I'm going to end there on that positive note. It has been fascinating uh, speaking with you and hearing about your work. Uh, and perhaps it'll help all of us achieve some goals in our lives. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's uh, lovely to be here. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Anil Kashyap who uh, connected with uh, me with your organization. Uh, very happy to be here and maybe next time in person. That would be great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That brings us to the close for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Come back again uh, for more programs. Uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.